Hi. Uh, who of you, hands up, who of you is here uh, uh, with the intention that they want to hear a uh, common voice talk about, you know, t t TTR accidentally here? Yeah, sorry about that. I, that's not going to happen. So if, if you were here, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to sneak out now, like, that's all right. Like, if, uh, who, who was here for the WebAssembly talk earlier today? All right, all right, all right. Uh, so I hope, hope you're ready for more then. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you, Joanna, for the introduction. As uh, she mentioned, my name is Flaki, which is the short version of Smoljanski Istvan. Um, I'm originally from Hungary. Um, I work with Mozilla uh, as developer outreach and the tech speakers program um, and, um, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, my, my, in my free time, I do a lot of IoT and hardware stuff, so, so if you want to talk about that, uh, I'm really happy to chat about those things as well. Uh, and yeah, the talk's title is uh, Speed Without Shenanigans, um, which is going to be mostly talking about, you know, how WebAssembly became a thing, why did WebAssembly became a thing, who, uh, like, why did we need this thing in the first place, and how did you get to a point when it actually seems to be that it is going to be a big part of the future of the web. Um, so I hope you, uh, you join me on this journey. So the story really starts around 2012. Um, JavaScript uh, has been, the, uh, and it is de facto language of the web as we know it. Uh, but basically JavaScript was used to be this thing that you know, powered a scripting engine inside the web browser so you know you could ma make your mouse cursor like uh, your like little like tiny blobs follow or bubbles follow your mouse cursor or something like that and you know it didn't really need a whole lot of computing power but it started growing it started growing uh, Gabrielle already uh, mentioned how you know the improvement uh, of the features that web browsers would provide you uh, like the the sheer scale of what was possible in the browser was also making you put more code into the browser. Uh, this eventually resulted in uh, you know, a big boom in code inside the browser and a huge uh, growing need for uh, this code to be faster, this code to be more versatile. Uh, in 2012, uh, the V8 engine uh, got released that kind of started a, a third browser war between the browser vendors trying to, you know, uh, uh, trying to uh, kind of increase the speeds of their, their JavaScript engines as their competitors would, you know, improve their engines and would taunt, you know, the other browser vendors that ours is the fa fastest JavaScript engine, what do you do now? And that kind of, you know, also came out a lot of research, a lot of knowledge sharing, but basically ended up with a boom in JavaScript ex execution speeds. And uh, this boom didn't falter for several years uh, until at some point um, in 2019, uh, um, uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 2015, uh, a browser started thinking about, hey, this is good, like uh, the increasing amount of code in the browser is cool, uh, but we have a lot of pre-existing code bases that are not written in JavaScript. And as you know, code bases in the browser grew, people are like, we kind of want to reuse the code that uh, we use other platforms. And somebody came up with the uh, crazy sounding idea of how about we actually just, uh, we, instead of manually you know, porting code from one, one device to the other in the web, uh, we just make machines to do this. Like make machines translate from some one language and create, generate code in JavaScript. So basically transcompile like uh, lower level languages into, into browser languages. And this is how ASMJS came along. And this is uh, how Mscripten came along. So if you're also here for, for, the, uh, for the previous talk, um, Mscripten was one of the defining factor how ASMJS came to the scene and uh, started uh, this, this journey towards you know, in, in, uh, enabling browsers to do low level code, run low level code in the browser itself. And you know, ASMJS was just a format that browsers figured out that would be easy enough 
Uh, SMJS is very tricky because it, it is still JavaScript. It's just a very weird JavaScript that you definitely wouldn't want to write by hand. Some people still do, but you know, uh, some people you know, do weird uh, shit anyway. Uh, so uh, it was not meant to be you know, ver written by hand, but generated by you know, the megabytes uh, from uh, low-level source code. And um, that idea of you know, uh, making it closer to what a machine representation of program code is, uh, it would actually be easier for browser engines to optimize it. So what would happen is a, the mscripten or any other compiler, there were some you know, other compilers, but mscripten kind of became, uh, became the de facto standard of taking some low-level uh, language, a, a code base written in C, for example, C++, uh, and generating JavaScript source code that kind of looked like machine code, but it was still valid JavaScript code. And browsers would detect this JavaScript code and would realize that, hey, I can actually easily optimize this and optim create an optimized version of it that could work uh, pretty fast e even in browser. So the whole, whole idea you get is like, one, of, one part of it is code reuse, but also one part of it is, it's just wanting to do more on the web. Like these bundles would end up, you know, hundreds of megabytes uh, on some some uh, some occasion because they are still JavaScript. They would take a long time to parse, and people were, you know, but they would they would be uh, doing some amazing, uh, amazing things. Like uh, you just seen this demo uh, if you have been earlier here. Uh, like there there are full 3D engines running in in the web browser, uh, and that was. Uh, possible with the SMJS. But people started seeing the limitations of this format and this idea uh, and, and wanted to do more. You know, you put 100 megabytes of JavaScript in the browser, you made something a 3D, you wanted to do 60 FPS, you wanted to do 3D, uh, uh, 3D, uh, wanted to do anything else. So the games industry was a big uh, supporter of uh, making all these compiled to JavaScript, compiled to web languages happen. And it's easy to see why. So it's easy to see why this happened. Uh, the web is today is one of the biggest publishing targets. Uh, you can reach the largest audiences with. Like you have a you know a Unity engine or, or you have a some some low level engine that could you know generate apps for Android, generate apps for iOS, maybe desktop apps even, and you would be you know but. The easiest way to reach my the easiest way to reach my uh, my audience is actually just send them a link, and they open it in a web browser and they can play my game, and so this became uh, this kind of cross-platform reach became a huge drive behind uh, web en uh, implementers trying to put this thing uh, and push this thing further along. Uh, yeah, so as Dave Herman uh, used to be leading the Mozilla Research Group says, the, the main reason I care about the web is because it's the world's biggest software platform that's not owned. Nobody can tell you uh, that I'm not allowing your app into my app store because you're going to release a link for it. I mean, you know, unless you're like an oppressed government and they're literally going to be like shutting the, uh, uh, the access to your website down. But... Apart from that, nobody can tell you that you're not able to distribute your content. And it's easy to access as well. So it made a whole lot of sense. So all these, all these things are seeded by all these, uh, all these sources and powers, like the needs for, for improving this, this, this kind of language that was AS ASMGS that developed, uh, kind of... Uh, impre increase the need for, for, for going further away. And, and the interesting part about this is uh, ASMJS was a thing that it's still JavaScript, but your JavaScript engine in the browser could optimize it in a way that it could run faster. As, as fast as, uh, you know, uh, twice as slow uh, or even 1.5 times as slow as, um, as native code. Uh, there are limits to how, how, how far you can go, uh, but WebAssembly today can uh, run very close to, to uh, whatever uh, native code uh, could execute in the browser. The problem was not that. The problem was the other features of this ASMJS thing uh, that made it 
cumbersome to use and, and problematic. One of the things that I mentioned was actually uh, that this was still JavaScript, which means that it ha needs to be uh, parsed as JavaScript. And you know, as you might know, uh, parsing something is always going to be tougher than if you're going to be creating an intermediate format for it that's purpose made that is going to be parsed for. So some of these uh, code actually takes faster, uh, take, take, took longer time to parse the JavaScript blobs than to actually compile it to the, to the native representation. So you would, the browser would spend you know, seconds uh, on just uh, parsing the downloaded 20 megabyte JavaScript file. So they were like, we need something else. We need something different. And eventually, fueled by a lot of these constraints that the old language had, WebAssembly was born. So this is, you know, uh, you got an overview of how kind of, like, WebAssembly is not, you know, somebody came up with this idea, and they're like, there, there's a lot more to unpack behind it. There's a lot more, you know, efforts in trying to make, like, low-level functionality work in the browsers, P, uh, PNACL and a bunch of others. Uh, but basically, it didn't came out from nowhere. There was like a clear need for people wanting to do more in the browser, and WebAssembly seems to be uh, one of the uh, best answers that we can give to to these problems today. Uh, one of the reasons for that is actually that it's a joint effort, uh, a joint effort across all four browser vendors, uh, major browser vendors, Microsoft, Apple. Uh, uh, Google and, and Mozilla uh, led to this effort into WebAssembly being released uh, pretty much at the same time in all four major browsers and the, and the newest versions of major browsers. Uh, also, part of this, you know, when you try to coordinate four, four of the, uh, at least three of the biggest uh, companies on Earth and like uh, you know, uh, four of the uh, four huge internet companies on Earth. Like you're gonna have a lot of different differing agendas. So they are like, okay, what's the minimum that we can ship to a browser that could work, that we could agree on, and just to make sure that this thing happens. And this, uh, the, uh, this is what we call the WebAssembly MVP, the minimum viable product, the minimum useful WebAssembly you know, core that you're gonna be able to extend and build on in the future uh, to create extra, extra things. And uh, so basically what they did is they ditched the JavaScript E representation, they created a binary representation. This binary representation can be parsed into like kind of a S tree. So it's still transparent, it's still easy to understand, but it, it goes through much faster in the wire, but more importantly parses almost instantly. Browser engines currently compile WebAssembly as it got, uh, comes down the line in the internet. So as soon as the code arrives, pretty much it's almost usable. And you know, they started using it for things. You know, ASMJS showed the path. You know, you could compile low-level things like the Internet Archive started you know, uploading games online, and people went even further. You know, uh, hey, what if we could uh, we could like re-implement the whole operating system and go as as deep down as start you know, as long as we can compile a C code base. Uh, we can create shims for stuff. Like we can like re-implement the whole browser, and like people went crazy with these ideas uh, when when ASMJS came out. And WebAssembly actually gives you uh, the tooling to take WebAssembly out of the browser. Uh, WebAssembly has a core specification that actually has nothing to do with the web. Uh, it's actually embedded. This WebAssembly core specification is embedded and implemented in a web browser. But nothing tells you that you have to use it in the web browser. Uh, there is a uh, experimental kernel uh, called Nebulet that allows you to run WebAssembly programs. Uh, basically, it's, a, it's an entire kernel that runs uh, WebAssembly code as, as user land. So basically, all your, uh, this Nebulet operating systems, uh, system is basically, it's an experiment. But it, the, all the user land code actually lives in WebAssembly, which is great because WebAssembly is sandbox. That means WebAssembly is secure by default uh, against a bunch of uh, memory access problems and issues that came up, that comes up and need a lot of mitigation in traditional operating systems. So this is just one of the things that shows you that uh, it quite often arises a need that you need 
you need more performance, you need more control over whatever you are able to accomplish in your stack. And this was the same thing for browsers, but this doesn't come, uh, doesn't come uh, just for browsers. This ca comes up in Node.js, this comes up in, in other systems. You know, in Python, uh, you want to do mathematical calculations, you're gonna pull in a binary module that does mathematical calculations, and that's actually compiled C code. So you're not gonna do the uh, performance sensitive calculations in Python. Uh, like actual Python code, but you're going to implement them in a more effective uh, language and just pull them in into the language of source. And this is exactly how you should think about WebAssembly, and this is how WebAssembly tries to be the fix. It tries to be the fix for the problem when you need more speed or you need lower level functionality. Uh, WebAssembly allows you to bring that into the web sphere or the web browser, and also other host environments that are embedding uh, uh, WebAssembly. For example, I already mentioned Node.js. Node.js is not a typical, it's still a JavaScript embedding environment, but it's not a typical browser environment. But uh, uh, a potential fix to the, uh, a lot of the problems could be WebAssembly, when you don't need to compile native modules to access low-level functionality uh, low, uh, uh, high speed uh, functionality, uh, but uh, WebAssembly is able to provide you with these. And there are a bunch of stories already in the, on the internet that somebody re-implemented this one core thing in WebAssembly and saved their company a million dollars. Uh, I'm not even exaggerating. Uh, so there's already a lot of, you know, it's an MVP, uh, a minimum viable product, but people are already exploring uh, the edges of these systems. And this is why it's important uh, that you, uh, when you try to dive in, uh, you try to uh, get the lay of the land, you're gonna bump into things like what Mozilla is doing is replacing some parts of the Firefox browser with, uh, with parts compiled to WebAssembly. And uh, Mozilla is actually doing this in Rust, uh, which I'm gonna talk in a moment uh, why that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, but basically, there's already uh, uh, decent results of how this is happening. Now, what you see on stage, uh, uh, on the, uh, the slides, is a link to how Mozilla replaced some parts of the Firefox developer tools, uh, which, which are actually written in JavaScript and HTML5. Uh, some parts of those, they replaced with a WebAssembly implementation. This is a source map parser and they had ex, uh, huge gains in, in performance and, and stability uh, in, in this performance um, that they could achieve uh, with a very straightforward Rust code base that was way more understandable than the hacky uh, JavaScript code base that was trying to make sure that the uh, JavaScript engine is happy and performant, stays performant. And and there's this secret sauce in here. Uh, uh, if you've ever been to the Rust Dev Room, is it uh, uh, last year? And I think to, uh, tomorrow uh, uh, is also, there's a Rust Dev Room here at FOSM. I can very much recommend you check that out. Uh, even if you've never heard about like low level languages or, or, or just a web developer trying to get by, because Rust is really trying to change the way how uh, you're implementing performance sensitive code in the browser, uh, trying to give you a chance to, uh, to use some of the, the performance characteristics that was limited to low level code, or limited to you know, uh, native code, uh, to give you this power as a, as a uh, web engineer or JavaScript engineer. And how they do this, and why, uh, uh, the most important part of this is is that it provides you, uh, Rust provides you uh, with speed uh, without the wizardry. Uh, Rust, uh, like I mentioned, uh, can create a very straightforward code base um, that actually compiles to WebAssembly and creates a very performant uh, out output code uh, using WebAssembly or even uh, uh, like a fallback uh, uh, ASMGS implementation you are able to, to generate uh, a high performing code that could replace parts of your website that are performance sensitive. 
And there are a lot of, already a lot of uh, examples for this, not just from Mozilla. Uh, for example, WordPress is trying to re-implement some of their infrastructure for their editing infrastructure in, in WebAssembly or uh, in Rust and, and uh, providing WebAssembly output for it. And there is a, there's a whole lot of in-browser or out-of-browser use cases that are already using this. And I already mentioned that Rust is an MVP and it's kind of this minimal, uh, sorry, WebAssembly is this MVP and this minimal thing that you can use to, uh, to make WebAssembly uh, suddenly happen across all the browsers because it was very important to make sure that you know, every browser is on, in on it. Uh, but there is, there's a future. And you know, as, as people start experimenting it, people already, you know, hey, how can, I, how can I access the, the DOM? I cannot access the browser DOM. Hey, how can I uh, uh, access the garbage collector? All of these questions are raising, uh, being raised uh, by people who are experimenting with the technology and trying to push the boundaries. And there are an answers to the question, the answers to those questions is that they are in the works. Uh, the committee didn't stop it, uh, the, the MVP. Actually, the MVP, was something that was about to ship in browsers, uh, but they already had some of these laid down in the moment WebAssembly appeared for end users. They just didn't want to block on things that they just couldn't figure out or some things that they wanted uh, industry feedback on. So they put those ideas aside and they were like, hey, we're gonna come back when we have more implementer feedback, more feedback from our users. We're gonna see how these things to, uh, fit together. And this is exactly what's happening today. Uh, so this illustration is from Lynn Clark. Lynn Clark is amazing. Uh, she has multiple, uh, multiple uh, talks and, and articles uh, about how WebAssembly is changing currently uh, the landscape in the browser. Uh, and this particular talk is one of her latest when she lays out the land of what is implemented currently and what are the things that you need uh, uh, that people uh, are usually asking for and also that we see uh, to make the, the WebAssembly ecosystem and the web ecosystem in the first place uh, actually reach its full potential. Like I mentioned, access to garbage collector and a bunch of others on, the, on this roadmap. Some of these features are already like, uh, implemented in browsers behind flags. Firefox nightly can use some of the, uh, some of the functionality related to, to types uh, in, and reference types in, in, in Firefox. So some of these functionalities slowly landing, people are starting to experiment with those uh, to extend the reach of the platform. And uh, like to, to wrap this whole thing up, like the whole idea, and there's a lot of fear, a lot of, you know, and also some people are cheering uh, this, this idea along that, uh, that WebAssembly is here and you can finally ditch JavaScript and you know, you're not really gonna need it anymore. And that's not the idea. And you know, I keep telling people that I've been following the JavaScript language from the spec level uh, for like several years now. Uh, JavaScript has evolved as a language uh, a lot and is, uh, is becoming much more, more and more usable uh, every day as, as every day passes and every new version of the specification comes out. Uh, so you don't want to ditch the, uh, the specification uh, and the JavaScript in general, but, jo uh, but WebAssembly can be there for you uh, when some of the use cases warrant that you have uh, a more performant core uh, or like a more, tra um, uh, a more portable code base uh, across your know, projects and, and, and devices uh, that you, you could reuse and, and uh, plug it into your existing code base like painlessly. And there's a lot of work going on into the Rust uh, programming language to make it a programming language to, to, uh, to provide these use cases because not every JavaScript programmer is, uh, is a low-level system as an engineer with C or C++ knowledge. Uh, so Rust is becoming a, a, a good you know, starting language for, I, I'm gonna, I want to learn a low-level language that will let me create WebAssembly uh, that I could embed in, in these use cases. Or if you already know C or C++ or have code, uh, code bases in C or C++, uh, the ability for you to reuse them in these contexts is uh, really what this ecosystem is aiming at. And I think the projector really wants me to, to get off stage now. So uh, the, the purpose of this talk is really to, first of all, to, start, uh, to ask you to start experimenting and also to, to, uh, to get excited about the future uh, because a lot of these features as they land 
uh, they're going to make a, a big splash in the web ecosystem as we know them today and going to make a, a lot of changes, exciting changes, not bad changes, you know, uh, but exciting changes happen in the future. So the talk is online on this URL, uh, which is super good because at the end of this talk, there's a lot of links and resources that you can uh, follow up uh, because you know, I could talk about this the whole day, but uh, there are better uh, ways to, to, uh, to get your knowledge in. And there are two links here as well. SL Software is my uh, Twitter handle if you want to tweet at me. At MossHex and the Mozilla Hex blog is uh, where you can follow a lot of uh, the Mozilla Developer out uh, Outreach or uh, DevRel team. Uh, and where Link Clark and a lot of other engineers at Mozilla post uh, about some of these upcoming features of their browser, be that Firefox or WebAssembly or a bunch of these technologies. So thank you. Thanks so much, Flaky. Questions? Because we do have time. Yes, I'm coming. I'm going to do my 21K of walking today here. <laughs> I'm beating my steps. Hi. Uh, thanks for clarifying the context around the WebAssembly. What I didn't get, though, yet, neither from your talk uh, nor from the previous one, is uh, how do you actually use it practically? So suppose you have a, a kind of a Rust project that uh, uses like a native UI, say an NCURSES UI, yeah. or uh, how do I go from, uh, you know, like compile, uh, set a target to WebAssembly to, uh, you know, like deploying that on a web page? Yeah, so basically the, the usual workflow is you have some source code base, be that Rust or anything else. Uh, you compile the source code base into, into WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a very limited language in terms of types. Uh, so what it actually boils down to is basically you ha only have access to integers. This is some of the stuff that's changing in the future, but because all computers have is like binary numbers in their memory, every problem can be you know, turned into a problem that only includes binary numbers and like, you know, basically memory, uh, chunks of memory. So basically what you pass into and out of, get out of a WebAssembly program is like chunks of memory or chunks of bytes. And uh, this means that you have to serialize your JavaScript code into a format that WebAssembly will understand, we will do the computation and give you back something uh, from WebAssembly uh, that you can also like deserialize and like consume on your uh, application. So this is the general idea. Is WebAssembly is a very limited operating, uh, it's basically a very limited uh, instruction set, a tiny computer uh, with uh, limited uh, access to types or like variable types that, that it has. So basically, what you, what, when you write some code, uh, that code has to interact with the JavaScript or whatever front-end ecosystem in a way that, 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 makes, it, uh, uh, that makes sense. Uh, now, this is something, actually, that uh, the Rust team is trying to work on a lot. And this is what I was mentioning with the uh, Rust uh, and WebAssembly interop. You will actually see a link here uh, in reflecting on Rust and WebAssembly in 2018. Rust has an entire team that are developing tools for you that you're able to be using your Rust types uh, to access JavaScript objects and your JavaScript code to access Rust objects without having to write this boilerplate code that is going to do the translation from binary code to, to JavaScript-like types. Um, they actually created an entire ecosystem around this to make this easier. So if, you, if you're interested more about this interrupt, that, that's a good, good starting point to, to, to go. Uh, but also, like the future is also going to be bringing a lot of the features that are going to make it easier to define custom types, and, like make WebAssembly understand structs or like custom types inside WebAssembly, pass things inside into and out of like WebAssembly. There are more complex objects, not just numbers. So a lot of these things are still you know, in the future roadmap. Yes, uh, can you help me pass the mic? Hi. Um, my question is, uh, what are the limits of WebAssembly? So, for example, um, what I want to do is I want to uh, communicate with the uh, GPU drivers, APIs. Yeah. So I think that's not possible. So where uh, are the limits? Uh, well, the thing is, uh, WebAssembly, as I just mentioned, like WebAssembly itself 
has nothing to do with the web or the browser itself. Uh, the browser is just an embedder of the WebAssembly core specification. And what WebAssembly does is you pass it a bunch of numbers. It like, does some calculations very fast on them and just gives you back a bunch of other numbers. Uh, this means that the only way to access the, the graphics card uh, from the WebAssembly application is you actually make some, uh, for example, you use WebGL uh, in a web browser context or in some of these embedding contexts, like uh, your WebAssembly runtime will actually call uh, uh, native language functions that it is going to be accessing the, the native drivers. So if, uh, from a uh, web standpoint, WebAssembly has no access to anything. WebAssembly has only access to the things that you give it okay, access to. So it's to. everything sandboxed. I'm sorry? Everything is sandboxed. Everything is sandboxed, exactly, yeah. Correct. Yeah, so the only things that you, uh, you get access to are the APIs, the DOM APIs that you pass in. But the problem is you cannot call those APIs because you cannot, you know, the convention of the objects that you have to pass into these uh, APIs, you have no access to in WebAssembly. And these are some of the things that are coming in the future to make this accessible from inside WebAssembly instead of having to translate uh, between those using your platform's APIs. All right, are there other limits? Uh, what do you mean by limits? So there, there are know. limits like 32-bit uh, addressable memory, uh, which is also one on the roadmap to change that. Uh, I can really recommend link logs. If you really want to like, have an overview of what are the current limits and how are they going to be uh, improved, a uh, link large article that I linked to here uh, is, is a perfect one because it explains all these limitations that we currently have and what cases they, do those apply. You know, a lot of like high computation uh, like problems are not impossible because of the, the memory limitations of 32-bit. Like she explains those like excellently. All right, thank you. Uh, my question just links to the previous one because my understanding was that, uh, uh, for example, all those demo that we saw in WebAssembly using uh, in the end use, using yeah. OpenGL, I guess, yeah. uh, were just uh, mapping open, OpenGL calls to WebGL calls. But uh, as far as uh, technically, uh, yeah, yeah, basically, yes. So you so you have uh, access to WebGL directly from WebAssembly, or do you have to go out, go back to JavaScript, and then call? Good question. No, yeah, uh, yes, you have to go to JavaScript. Uh, those, uh, a lot of those code that I see is, so what, Web is, uh, what Rust tries to do, Rust actually has like a direct output to WebAssembly. Uh, because of that, you have to do a lot of those things manually. And this is why the Rust, Web, Rust Wasm project uh, started creating those bindings generators, like again, like you can read about this. Uh, that could take care of like uh, doing this glue code, uh, this JavaScript glue code that you will need. Uh, the other thing, uh, like the other projects, usually, sorry, usually use mscripten, and a lot of the mscripten architecture has already had these glue code made because ASMJS was doing the same exact thing. ASMJS was also communicating with WebGL, like kind of like translating this to this like ABI uh, of a a mscripten. And they had this shim in the browser, the runtime, basically the ASMJS runtime, that had these translations from the, you know, the native language that you're, uh, you're coming from, which is basically OpenGL or like some OpenGL API uh, output, uh, the mappings into WebGL uh, in the browser. And uh, basically, what, what you didn't have to worry about that because, or you also don't have to worry about that if you compile with that mscript uh, because it has these shims built in. Uh, in the future, uh, you might be able to uh, pass in data structures uh, directly from your WebAssembly code, so you could generate these data structures that you need for WebGL calls uh, directly inside your WebAssembly code and pass those onto, like for example, the Web, uh, WebGL APIs. So you could like skip this like JavaScript trampoline uh, that you would need in general, but currently you're not able to supply the arguments to these functions because WebAssembly doesn't know about those types that these functions accept. So you still have to do like the translations the same way on the other way around. If you're going to do input into your mscript, uh, if you're thinking about games, all the networking, all the, uh, uh, all the inputs uh, like keyboard and game, gamepad inputs, those are all coming from web APIs via a JavaScript shim that translates those into some kind of uh, WebAssembly understandable data structures, pushes it into the WebAssembly, 
Uh, audio is the same thing as, as the graphics. It, you know, WebAssembly generates some kind of sound buffers that it's going to transfer into the Web Audio API. So all this, like WebAssembly has, knows nothing about the surrounding world. Those are all Web APIs, that, the same Web APIs you would be using. But some tools like, like MScript then takes care of like, the translation between the two uh, if you're using a, a specific setup in your like, C++ code base or, uh, or uh, if, you, if they already have those mappings defined and those, those shims already are, exist. Is it possible to use uh, Rust and MScript currently, or is it just for... So, so what Rust does is Rust kind of, it outputs its own uh, thing, so they usually don't reuse the shims, but they, use, uh, they do their own. So uh, Rust is actually a better, uh, uh, the Rust bosom is a world is better if you're actually trying to interact with the browser. Uh, because they actually have uh, JavaScript implementations, uh, like JavaScript API implementations and a bunch of other stuff re-implemented in Rust. So you can write your Rust code and call JavaScript functions and APIs from inside your Rust code, and those are going to be automatically translated in the browser. But not necessarily for gaming use cases, uh, except for you know, libraries that have those lying around. But I mean, you can also like you know, merge the two worlds and uh, just take some of these from 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 the mscript and repo and just try to make it work. Uh, obviously, that will also work, but it's a lot more manual work. Okay, thank you. Any last questions? I'll take this as a no. Thank you yeah. so much, Rekia. Thank you.